So um, I don't know what time it is where you are. Uh, what are you drinking today? I'm in water, even though it's almost five, it's five o'clock. I'm also drinking water, but admittedly, I wish it was a little stronger than water. It's uh, <laughs> 6 p.m. here, so. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, six o'clock, yep. Yep, my dinner will be after dinner. The dinner's after this, it'll be a little bit stronger. But water's always good because then it just, uh, when you're talking, if I feel like you get all croupy and. Yeah, my I, kid's going to preschool now. Like it's her first real week of preschool. And so I've just been uh-huh. drowning myself in caffeinated beverages. So I should probably drink more water anyway. Actually, when I was <laughs> visiting the States, I went and was influenced to buy one of these massive Stanley cups that's taken over the internet. Um, so I have no excuse for not being hydrated. That is big. It's 20 ounces. Oh, I have no idea what ounces are anymore. It's, yeah, it's 40 ounces and 1.18 liters. <gasps> 40 ounces and 1.8 liters. Okay. Yeah. That's, that is really big. I love the idea of having a lot of water, but honestly, I'm mm. afraid I would tip it over. Well, it's like it's so tall. I can literally like fit my whole hand through it. Like it's ridiculous. And I know it's ridiculous, but, um, as someone who has, <laughs> this is me sharing way too much about myself on the internet. As someone who suffers from kidney stones really badly mm-hmm. because I'm dehydrated, I should probably <laughs> drink it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My husband has that too. And when he gets dehydrated, I'm like, uh, you got to drink the water. Mm. <laughs> gotta it's drink not the water. worth the pain. Yeah. <laughs> I hear they're really painful. I've never had them, but I hear they're like, go to the hospital painful. Yeah. I mean, I was never in natural labor with my child, which I've heard it compares to, but, um, let me tell you, I had them for the first time on a cruise ship in the Gulf of Mexico. And they were like, y'all, like, we don't know what's wrong with you. So we're just going to like pump you up on some pretty gnarly painkillers. So we get back to Houston. And I was like, well, sounds good. (laughs) They were like, yeah, you've got kidney stones. And then I had to go on and have two surgeries for it. It was just a mess. Oh, that's a lot. 10 out of 10 recommend not going through that. (laughs) Yep. Yep. My husband was at a family reunion. They took the last picture and he's like, okay, now can somebody drive me to the emergency room? And I guess he sat there's the whole family reunion and then was like immediately in the emergency room, you know? So mm-hmm. I hear yeah, it's no bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll get going. We're not going to talk about water and kidney stones the whole time, but um, it looks like we still have a few folks filtering in, but I think we're going to get started. Um, so thank you for joining and welcome to Lead Dev Bookmarked. Uh, Lead Dev is a global community of engineering leaders who come together to discuss all things tech, leadership, teams, and tools. Bookmarked is our monthly book club that takes place on the first Tuesday of every month. Our sessions cover an array of engineering and leadership books that our awesome Lead Dev audience can draw insights and practical experiences from. I'm Susan Bond. Uh, I'm the moderator of Bookmarked. Um, I'm a former COO of a scaling startup and a leadership consultant. My specialty is tech leaders. You can find me at Twitter at Susan Bond and um, everywhere else on the internet. Um, today we'll be talking about decoding the technical interview process. If you uh, by Emma Bostian, who is here with me, and um, if you have questions for Emma, please pop them into the Q and A feature on Zoom, and I will um, we'll we'll get to some of those questions. Um, before we get started, a quick note to mention that Lead Dev um, are currently doing some research for the launch of a podcast for the Lead Dev community, and they'd love to hear your thoughts. There's a link to a super quick survey in the Lead Dev bookmarked Slack channel um, and in the Zoom chat. If you could spend a couple, a few minutes filling that out, that would be great. Um, also feel free to share with your colleagues, the more the merrier. So um, Emma Bastian is an engineering manager at Spotify in Stockholm. She is the author of Decoding the Technical Interview Process and the co-host of the Ladybug podcast. Welcome, Emma. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's nice to well, meet you, talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Great. I just noticed, I didn't know you had a podcast. What's the podcast about? Yeah. So I did have a podcast with a couple other ladies. Um, Mm. There uh, at the end, there were four of us uh, from all different walks of tech. You know, um, one of us had started a business. One of us was working at AWS as an engineering manager. Um, uh, And we were just talking about tech and career, but uh, because I had a baby and then another one of us had a baby and another one bought a Porsche, we decided, you know, (laughs) we're all busy with our children. So (laughs) might as well just uh, hit pause for a little bit. (laughs) I love another one bought a Porsche. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's great. All right. Well, so I would love to know, how did this book come about? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, So it was uh, the 
middle of almost the middle of 2020, um, when I think we all were suffering the consequences of the pandemic. And I had just signed my job offer to move from Germany to Stockholm to join Spotify. And I was also in the midst of like waiting for an offer from Google. So I passed all my tech interviews with them and whatnot. Um, and people were getting laid off left and right from the pandemic because the industry didn't know how to cater to a virtual workforce. And I sat there and I realized like, okay, so I've just been through the interview process at some major companies. And like, uh, I also have a degree in computer science. And unfortunately, the tech interview process is largely geared towards CS concepts like sorting algorithms and, and big O and things like that. Uh, and so I said, you know what, screw it, like, I'm going to sit down and just in 30 days, bang out this, you know, 250 page ebook about computer science concepts and take home projects and tech screens and all of those things. And yeah, it was a whirlwind. <laughs> wow. And so, you know, that's really fast 30 days. Mm. Absolutely. Wow. That's kind of how I work. I've talked a little bit about this online, but it seems like it could be really productive. But um, in all honesty, I do think that I am dealing with a lot of ADHD. And what that means is I sit down and I work really, really hard on something. It's all encompassing. And then I don't touch it for the rest of my life. And so it was one of those situations where I just banged it out really fast. And then like, it kind of dissipated. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I got that. I mean, that's great when you can sort of lean into that you know, and get that all put out there into the world. Yeah, absolutely. That's so great. Okay, so we all know the interviewing process can be really lengthy. It can require mm. a lot of time and it can disadvantage those who have less time, you know, like those who are taking care of other people and other assorted situations. Um, I'm curious what you think companies can do to ensure that their processes address this concern. Mm. Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, so I think the biggest thing is to give candidates options. So there are two massively important things. So the first is to give candidates options. So instead of just forcing them into this like streamlined approach of like, you have to have a one hour phone screen and then you have uh, like five hours of on-site interviews where you have to come in for the day. And um, that's really cognitively heavy. So maybe offer them a take home project or offer them like, hey, here's a week, here are a couple of tasks to get done, like do it at your own leisure. Um, you know, and they, they mimic the real world. So when I interviewed for an open source maintainer role, there were three tasks and they were all for the job. Like they were literally what I would have been doing day to day on the job. And not only that, this is the second thing, they paid me, they paid me for my time, um, especially if they're going to be doing work that they may or may not be using. Um, so those are kind of the two big things. Uh, I also remember I spoke with um, a, a person once who he was using a mouth stick to type. So, uh, mm. you know, he had a disability that required him to use a mouth stick um, to type on his keyboard. And he went through a tech interview process and they weren't accommodating of his setup. And so as a result, he was already disadvantaged because, uh, you know, he, it, it would have taken him immensely longer to complete the challenge given like the restrictions on the interview process than it would for a candidate who doesn't use a mouth stick to type. So um, it's not just in terms of like the overall process, but also like the interviews themselves have to be accessible to every candidate. Well, I'm interested to think that's such a good example. My guess is that they probably didn't really consider that someone might be using a mouth stick. I think sometimes we don't those things are sadly not thought of. We don't think about them quite mm -hmm. as often. What do you think they might have been able to do differently for someone like that? It's a good question. I mean, I think the biggest thing is asking candidates before the interviews, is there anything that you need to be successful in this interview from a hardware or software perspective? Maybe they're using a screen reader, uh, you know, maybe... Yeah, like I said, mouth stick that they need to type. Um, just ask them, is there anything that you need to feel comfortable in this interview? Um, you know, to be successful. And, you, you know, I think that's the best way to do it. Well, it is. I think sometimes folks, maybe they don't do that because they feel like they have to standardize everything and they don't want to mm -hmm. give exceptions or change things. I just wonder if that's part of the reason they don't ask people, what else do you need? 
I think also in the States, there's this taboo about what you can and can't ask about disabilities in particular. I think there's some legal aspects to that, uh, which is understandable, but I, I can't imagine that asking someone if they need a certain tool to be successful at this interview would violate that. Um, but I, what was the second, what, what was, I was going to say something additional and now I can't remember. <laughs> Well, and just this idea that they want to standardize things. So like they oh, feel yes. like they have to have it standard for everybody. The same thing, yeah. everyone to be fair. So I think there's a difference between um, fair and like the same exact thing for everyone. And I can't remember, it's like equitable versus equal or something to that extent, right? Like there's this concept, like if you have like three candidates and you make them do exactly the same challenge, you know, exactly the same time frame using a keyboard and a mouse and, you know, that isn't necessarily equitable for all. Like some people might like need a screen reader, for example, to communicate or to understand information. And um, that doesn't make it less fair. It makes it more fair. Mm, that's a great point. I mean, my, my partner is severely hard of hearing. And so, you know, uh, and actually he was in recently interviewing and one place did ask what else can we do? And there was a place mm -hmm. where he, he, there was a question, do you need anything? And he just said, I'm hard of hearing. And one thing was that they always had cameras on during interviews because mm -hmm. he reads lips and cameras off or noisy backgrounds are very hard you know, for someone like that to, to, because you're process, you're trying to process so much sensory information. Mm. And that really, I think helped him to be, feel more comfortable in the process. Totally. I think that's something we don't discuss enough is like, um, making sure that like we're reducing the cognitive load of an already stressful situation. Um, the other thing I thought about, um, one of the reasons that I chose Spotify was that it felt like a very human process. Literally the reason I accepted this job was the interview process was so human um not to say they didn't ask like challenging questions they did but they were relevant to the job in the field they weren't like brain teasers and not only that they let me use google to look things up so i always tell candidates if i interview them that like hey you're allowed to like look for things it helps me if you explain what you're doing as you're searching for it because let's be honest like we don't sit in isolation and not use a search engine when we're developing so you, you know, that's another thing that companies can do. What are they going to Google the answer to a question? Like if you've developed questions that are specific to the role and that are unique, um, they're not going to be able to just put that into Google and find the answer immediately. You know what I mean? Yeah, I love I, what I get about when you say human, that it's like knowing that people are human and allowing that, like make it, letting them be the best selves rather than trying to remember something, remembering something that you're never going to look up developers are always Googling things th throughout their day, mimicking what that might look like is what I hear from you. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I also, I always take on the approach of using this as a pairing session or like a teaching experience. So, if, if, you know, if you're going to have candidates who aren't as strong in, you know, whatever you're interviewing for, right, that's going to happen at some point. But the way that you make them feel about themselves after that interview should still be positive, right? Like, uh, they should leave that interview feeling good about themselves, regardless of if they found a solution or not. And so I always tell them, you know, this is a learning experience. We'll teach together. And let's say, you know, uh, if we're doing like this coding challenge and, and there's uh, an array that's passed into a function and someone is using um, like array at zero is variable one and array at two is variable two. Um, I'll say, oh, have you ever heard of like array destructuring? And if they say no, I'll be like, okay, so this is how you would do it. This is like the, the signature for that. How would you, could you like use this and maybe refactor, right? So not, it's not about making them feel unintelligent. It's about helping each other. Uh, so, yeah, and that would make you feel more human. Like, mm -hmm. absolutely, I totally get that. So something that I think a lot of people are asking about is, do you need a CS degree or is there an advantage to having one these days? And how do you think about this? Because I think people who don't have one might go into these interviews sometimes feeling maybe like, <laughs> mm, you know, I get, I understand that. And I empathize with that. And I think if you're to ask me, I would say, no, you absolutely don't need one. And in terms of knowledge, I don't think that you should need one. Um, unfortunately, in the industry, you are going to find people who gravitate towards computer science degrees or engineering degrees because they think that they're more meritable. That's not a word, but they have more merit, right? Um, which is total BS. Uh, and I hate seeing those types of takes in the industry. Um, you don't need a computer science degree. And in fact, the most 
brilliant engineers that I've ever met. Some had no degree whatsoever from any higher education. You know, some, some were just fully self-taught. Um, and so we also have to remember that education isn't accessible to everyone, especially in the US. Like college is extremely expensive, right? In other European countries, it's sometimes free. So you're gonna get a variation in candidates there. But um, the other piece to that is a lot of the questions previously in the tech industry interviews were geared towards computer science concepts, like sorting algorithms. And you had to know that like merge sort was more performant than bubble sort and why and what the big O notation was. Um, I think the ideas of different algorithms being more performant in terms of storage or time complexity is important, but do candidates really need to know that like O of n squared is less performant than O of n log n? No, they just have to be able to identify these things in real time and maybe be able to identify what they need to look up um, or ask a colleague or something, but you shouldn't need a computer science degree. Yep. Yeah, that's great. Hopefully that gives folks with that one some more confidence or, you know, like, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, it's already, a, listen, interviewing is always a stressful process, you know, and we're always wondering, am I okay? Am I, do I fit in all of those things when we're going to interview for a job? So um, what might a hiring manager consider for a hiring process that's positive for candidates? We've talked a little bit about it, but what tips might you give hiring managers? Yeah, um, so this is interesting because currently I am a hiring manager looking for a summer intern. And so I'm inundated with like thousands of applications, which is amazing. And I've looked at every single one of them and I've thought about the process for these candidates. Like I'm creating this process from scratch. I'm like, what do I need to think about? Um, and so if you are a hiring manager, I would encourage you to focus the process on finding candidates who demonstrate growth mindset versus like fixed mindset. Um, so there's a really great book I'd recommend to anyone uh, called Mindset. It's by Carol Dweck. And she talks about the duality between growth mindset and fixed mindset, right? So if you have a growth mindset um, and you fail at something, you don't identify yourself or like place yourself in a box saying like, this is my limit. This is all I've got. Um, I'm never going to be successful. It's it's literally an opportunity to grow and failure doesn't need to be a bad word when you've adopted a growth mindset. So tailor your experience to candidates such that you can identify, oh, this person really is interested to learn or um you know, isn't hard on themselves if they make a mistake, things like that. They take constructive criticism well. Um, I would also highly encourage having two interviewers. This is something that we do on our side. Um, the reason being that when you have two interviewers, it can seem a little intimidating. And at first I was not sold on the idea, but each interviewer is gonna submit their feedback in isolation before they come back to like calibrate their interviewing skills. Um, and the reason is some, all of us humans are uh, victims of unconscious bias. Um, and so unconsciously, we identify with people who remind us of ourselves or we have something in common with. And I've had to check my unconscious bias, like reviewing applications, like, oh, this person has a music background or um, they don't have a CS degree or things like that. Like, I can't prioritize those candidates or, or look at them more favorably because of that, right? So I would encourage two interviewers um, to, to make sure that you're unbiased in that respect. Um, I would also, like I said, approach the interview as a learning experience, a pairing experience, uh, learn together, right? I've learned things from candidates that I didn't know before, and I think that's great. Um, and then lastly, just ask questions that are relevant to the job, because uh, mm -hmm. we, we forget interviews are two-way streets. I think we'll talk about that more. Um, and as such, like maybe the, when I interviewed for that open source maintainer role, I quickly realized this is not a job I would enjoy. And as a result, like, I wouldn't do well at it. And so I pulled out of that process. So create questions mm -hmm. that are relevant to the job and not meant to trick people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no gotchas. Well, too, because when, when people go through the process and it's like a gotcha or trick you, even if they get through it, that doesn't really begin to create trust or a really good feeling between us. If I feel like, I don't know if you're trying to trick me or mm -hmm. you really are invested in my success. Exactly. Right? Yeah. I have, a, can, I want to ask a couple of follow-ups about what you said. I love this idea of growth mindset and that's a, it's a great book. What are some ways that people might be able to identify someone who has a growth mindset? 
Yeah. So I think what are they looking for? Right. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. (laughs) No, no, it's good. I think we're looking at how people approach the concept of failure. If you look at failure as something that limits you as a person, if you think that there's only so much that you're capable of in life and like it doesn't, you're not going to put an extra effort to uh, learn new skills because you know you're not capable of it. Um, that's a fixed mindset because, you know, that's alluding the fact or it's alluding to the fact that like my knowledge and my capabilities are fixed and there's nothing I can do to change that. Someone who has growth mindset will approach um, the the concept of failure as, as a learning opportunity, right? And so they, they've done all these studies with children where they would give them these like brain teasers um, and they would start easy and then the questions would get progressively harder and what they realized is like the first time a child with a fixed mindset failed and they offered them a harder challenge they all said no um, if they had a fixed mindset and if someone a, a child with a growth mindset was offered a bigger challenge even though they just failed they would say yeah bring it on like I can learn something from this. That's a that's a that's a really great tip to help begin to see that I want to follow up on one other thing that you said that you changed your mind about two interview having two interviewers. You know, and there's mm. a lot of benefits for that. And I think when I think what you said was one of your concerns about having two interviewers is like, would it overwhelm mm. somebody? Would it feel intimidating? Was there anything you did to make sure that you didn't? It's not feeling over- intimidating or overwhelming. You know, like a two on one sort of double teaming sort of thing. I think having a lead interviewer and a you know, a a co-interviewer is going to be the biggest thing. So the candidate knows, hey, this one person is leading the interview. And I will always stop as the lead interviewer before I move on and say, hey, you know, co-interviewer, do you have any questions or you want to add something? And in that way, like the candidate knows, okay, so this one person is running the interview and there are going to be specific times for the second person to chime in. Um, But in general, I think it's really good to, to open the interview just talking about like who you are as a person and kind of share a little bit about yourself so they know that you're a person and you're not just like this nameless, faceless, like engineer at a company they're interested in. That's a great, yeah, that's a great idea. Having sort of roles, someone's lead, someone's Mm. secondary to sort of help set that stage. So, all right. So another topic that's debated a lot is whether to let people do the technical interview in the program of their choice or whether you require mm-hmm. them to do it in one in particular. What are your thoughts about this? I think it has to be standardized regardless of the decision that you make. And so one of the, the tricky things that we were running into was all of our interview questions were written with the expectation that you need to use plain HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And that was the expectation, right? And then along the way, we'd start getting interviewers asking like, hey, can I let a candidate use TypeScript or React or another language of their preference because they're more comfortable with that? Um, And the issue with that is when you have a process designed for uh, the foundational web technologies, and let's say 80% of candidates are going through the interview questions using the foundational web technologies. But then like those, I don't know, what did I say? 70%, whatever, the remaining percentage are allowed to use something that they're more comfortable in, that puts that, them at an advantage, right? And we're talking about trying to evaluate candidates along the same scale while still making concessions to people who need like more accessible interview process, right? We're not talking about that. We're talking about the questions uh, and the, the limitations on that being asked. Um, we need to just standardize it. So if you want candidates to use React or TypeScript or want to allow them, that's totally fine, but you have to give that option to everyone. Mm, yeah, got it. So standardize by giving it to everyone or not giving it to anybody correct rather than like 80 percent of you do this and then 20 percent get that right (laughs) got it so like pick a lane and decide exactly Mm, got it um so do you have opinion about how you do it or does it has it changed you know whether you allow choice or not i think i used to be very old school in the mindset of like oh web interview should be done in you know, plain web technologies, um, just because that's what the web is built on, right? And so I was very much of the mindset of, you have to understand the foundational technologies before you should start jumping into React or TypeScript or other high level libraries and frameworks written on top of the languages. Like, how are you gonna know what some of these high level like uh, framework functions are actually doing to the code that you're writing when you don't understand basic JavaScript? And I was humble, humbly educated online about, well, 
people learn differently, right? We can't just assume that everyone's learning the same way we do. So while I learned HTML, CSS, and JavaScript in order before I learned React or TypeScript or Vue, whatever you're using, um, not everyone does. Some people, uh, and this is very cultural as well, some, some people learn the context of how to use these frameworks and libraries and the foundations come second, right? And so I think over time, my view has changed to not be so limiting. Um, the tricky part with allowing these frameworks and libraries is that when you provide like a, a desired answer or an answer key to your interviewers, because that is something that you give them as like a, a completed uh, program, it's just a little bit more overhead to do it in these different languages. But I don't think that that should be a limitation. Hmm. That's so great that you changed your mind. Thanks mm -hmm. for being open about that. That yeah, you know, again, growth mindset, right? You can change mm -hmm. your mind. You can see something different and say, oh, wait a minute. This is a different point of view that I might want to consider. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like in there deciding like overhead, there might be a little overhead that people might want to consider in terms of whether they want to offer choices or not. That just be mm -hmm. part of that consideration. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. All right. So um, I want to talk about something you mentioned earlier, which is interviewing is a two way street, right? Candidates are picking the company just as much as the company picks them. Um, what do you, tips do you have for people who want to find out if a company is right for them, like candidate mm -hmm. side? Yeah, so I guess we'll preface this by the fact that interviews are two way streets, but there are going to be situations in which you don't have the luxury to be too picky with getting a job interview. And we'll talk about that, you know, later. Um, but I would say you need to really examine what your motivations are at this point in your life. So when I became a manager, one of the things I've, I've been doing with my team is running this moving motivators exercise, which essentially analyzes all these different motivations like uh, power or autonomy or respect for my peers or money, things like that. Um, and ranking them in order relatively of what's most important to you, right? Like the ability to learn, things like that. So for me, if I'm at this point in my life where um, the ability to learn new skills is really important. I'm going to ask a job interviewer, uh, like, hey, what is there, you know, a pro or do you have any platforms that employees can use to learn? Or do you have a hack week? Or um, is there a budget to go to conferences? Things like that. Uh, if spare time, like uh, more of a flexible work schedule, because I have a baby and I need to leave to go pick her up from school in the afternoon, is, you know, ask about work-life balance. So I would encourage you to, to examine your moving motivators. Um, you know, if, if being surrounded by people from all over the world, speaking different languages, they're, you know, um, they came to this company through boot camps and through university and just being self-taught. That's important. Ask about diversity and inclusion. Do they have a department for that and, and all of that? So, so that's what I would recommend is find out what's important to you at this point in your life and ask questions that will indicate whether or not this company will support those things. Yeah, I think it's so good. I do think sometimes, I mean, I've done quite a bit, I've come out of the people camp, so I've done quite a bit of, you know, interviewing. I think sometimes people are afraid to ask those questions or think they shouldn't ask questions. But I'll say on the other side of the table, I love it when people ask those mm -hmm. questions because it helps me know, oh, you're thinking seriously about this. You're trying to imagine yourself here and does this work or not for you? And you know what you want. I love it when people do that. Absolutely. And we actually like on our rubric, it's on interviewing rubrics. Uh, it's it's not uncommon to have a space of like, did the candidate ask you any questions? If so, what were they? Right. Um, here's like some ideas for questions are, yeah, about learning. Ask about learning budget or opportunities to learn. Ask about um, like someone who you haven't seen be successful in this role, like why or at this company, like why weren't they successful or what makes someone successful here? What are the top traits of that? I had a candidate ask me that once. They were like someone that wasn't successful in this role at this company. Like, why do you think they weren't successful? And I was like, wow, that's a really great question. Now, maybe I'd frame it to be more positive, like someone who was successful. Like, why? Why? Um, but try to think about things like that. And of course, money is important, right? I, we all work for money. Like, let's be honest. <laughs> um, yep. The salary negotiations and all of that can definitely come. I would talk to your recruiter about that and not the interviewer because the recruiter is going to be the one to handle that. Um, so with the interviewer, ask, yeah, ask about uh, like how code reviews are done. Are they done in person? Are they more of a conversation? Things like that. I think it's really good. One thing you didn't say but that I sort of like hear maybe underneath it's like 
listen to yourself and like those Mm -hmm. instincts about what's important to you and what do you want? And even like the feeling, like, how is it feeling in here as we're talking about this? Are they open? Are they receptive? And like Mm -hmm. listening to what, who you are and what you want. And sometimes it's hard because we need to get a job, but like that's sort of what I, you know, have have definitely been there multiple times. Um, But I hear a little bit of like listening to yourself and centering your own self and thinking about that experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love that. So um, I think etiquette can be really confusing when interviewing for a job. I know my partner just went Mm -hmm. through this, um, particularly these days with more remote work. Um, How do you think about etiquette when it comes to interviewing? So yeah, I'm sure some of us have seen the crappy take floating around. I think it was LinkedIn where someone was saying that a candidate didn't mail him a handwritten letter by carrier pigeon And as a result, he automatically rejected him. And I'm sitting here thinking, like, how close-minded do you have to be to think this way, right? Um, First of all, who's using the real mail anymore? I don't know. But second of all, like, you've you've already asked for hours of this candidate's life. And now you expect them to take more time to write you a letter? That's absurd to me. And additionally, if these interviews are two-way streets, why aren't you writing them a thank you letter? Some some candidates don't even get followed up with, right? Um, So in terms of etiquette, I would say make sure that you're on time. I think that's the biggest thing. Or if you are going to be late where you can't make it, like let the interviewer know um, or your recruiter know. Um, I think being on time is the biggest thing. Uh, Other etiquette, I would say um, just, I don't know, be respectful. Like don't be rude. So like here's an example. I had a candidate once at a previous job that I was interviewing and um there were three stages to the interview like the first was kind of more just like web development questions um the second one was some more coding etc so we were on like I don't know section one of three and we were getting like we were talking through something and they didn't necessarily know the answer to the question and so I was trying to approach it from a teaching perspective of you know like let's educate each other together and discuss it and they cut me off in the middle of my sentence and said I don't think this is that important we should just move on and I'm sitting here like this would just be rude to cut like a friend off if they're talking if you're getting a beer or something like uh, so just basic human etiquette right don't cut people off um I'll respect you I would hope that you would also respect me in terms of how you speak to me um I think it's just basic human respect is is the biggest thing with etiquette. Uh, you well, know. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say like I wouldn't is it great if candidates have their camera on? Yeah, I think so, but at the same time I'm going to respect the fact that some, you know, we have to be inclusive and if someone chooses not to put on their camera for whatever reason, um I might make a note of that for the hiring manager to review, but it's not something that like I'm going to like badger you about, you know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I like your example too, when you talked about that candidate who said, this is not important, let's move on. You know, excuse me, you know, which is interesting because I think they were approaching it as like, here's this technical piece. And we have to remember that in an interview, everything, it's just also about the human interaction, how we communicate with each other. That is also everybody should be looking at and thinking about Mm. on both sides, on both sides. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, you've got 60 minutes to make an impression. And if I leave that interview feeling like I was talked down to, or I wasn't respected equally as I'm giving them my respect, like that's not someone I necessarily want to work with long-term. And there used to be this like saying of, oh, you should hire people that you'd be fine being stuck in an airport with overnight if you were on a business trip. And like, that's so like skewed as well, right? Like you shouldn't lean towards people that you get along with like on a friendly level, right? That's that unconscious bias coming into play. But you should also hire people that are hardworking, that are, but hardworking, but know their boundaries. Let's make that clear. Um, We have good work-life balance, but they can admit when they don't know something and they don't get offended uh, with constructive criticism and they're a team player. I'm not looking to hire someone who's a superstar, right? I'm looking to hire someone who wants to be there and they like learning and they're collaborative. Mm. All right. I have a question that, that when it comes to etiquette, I'm just curious, do you write thank you notes or emails after your interviews? Like after, if you're a candidate, I'm just curious if you've done that or, you know, you don't. 
I don't, because honestly, I don't have the mental capacity. I mean, interviewing's freaking exhausting, right? If I had an outstanding interview with an interviewer that made me feel super comfortable, yeah, I'll take the time. I mean, it's the same as like tipping culture in the U.S., right? Like this idea that you should tip someone if their their service was outstanding. That's the principle. It's not done in practice, unfortunately. But like, if if I had an outstanding interview, I will absolutely take the time. Um, yeah. I was just curious. I, I knew people might, might be wondering. I mean, I know my partner when mm. you know, when he was interviewing was like, "Do I write a note? Do I not write a note? What am I doing mm. here?" And and I think that there are the rules are different now. You know, how do we think about that? So I just wanted to hear what you said. Um, mm. So I've got one last question before I go to a couple of audience questions. Um, so it seems like you know we're seeing messages of layoffs every week on social media the tech industry has we you know just can continues to have those um what would you do if you were laid off yeah this is tricky um so the first thing is the fact that i'm an immigrant to sweden right now and so for me if i were to be laid off the first thing i would do and i'd probably preemptively do this just to know what the situation would be is to check what my visa cons like constraints are. Um, like if I get laid off, what does that mean for my visa status, right? I've got a family here, I've got a house here. Do I need to leave the country? So um, that would be step one for me. Um, the second thing would be get my CV in order um, and uh, CV or resume, depending, they're, they're a little bit different. Um, and I actually, I'm not going to go into details now, but I, I did work with LinkedIn talk uh, on a course. So if you have LinkedIn learning, like you can go check it out. It's about how to write a tech resume. And I go into detail over there. Um, and again, okay. you can have multiple, you can have multiple resumes. If you're a full stack engineer and you're applying for web development and backend development and full stack, have three resumes that showcase your skills, depending upon like what the job is. As a hiring manager, I can tell you that like if, if someone is like more backend heavy and they lead with that, but they're applying for a web role, even if they're super knowledgeable in web, if I see it's primarily back end, like it's not going to stack up against the the pure like uh, front end first candidates. So so have different resumes, right? Um, the next thing would be to get like my LinkedIn or whatever like social networking tool, like business professional networking tool. Um, I've found jobs through LinkedIn before, so I would recommend using that as a tool. Um, portfolios are optional. I think they're a really great additive, but um, portfolio could be blogs on Medium. They could be a GitHub. It doesn't have to be a, your own website, right? So the definition is very loose there, but just something to showcase your work if you don't have like a really extensive portfolio. Um, so those that would be that and then preparing for interviews, um, which is really tricky. I also made a course LinkedIn again called Ace Your Web Developer Interview that basically is practice interview questions for web devs. Um, but I guess just really quickly, there are some things as a hiring manager that I'm looking for. So I'll just quickly say that. Oh yeah, um, definitely glad to hear this that. This <laughs> could be really helpful. So this gets you through the application process and lands you an interview. Um, first of all, like your CV should focus on like the skills that you need to succeed in this job and all of the charisma and, and things like that can come in an interview. So don't worry so much about putting like, I'm a great team player, I'm a great communicator. Those things will naturally come up in an interview. Your goal is to lay on that interview. So um, the first and foremost is make sure you match the criteria. So if they're looking for someone in the EMEA time zone, so Europe, Middle East and Africa, don't apply from Canada or the US, don't apply from Australia because it's wasting your time. Like your time is valuable, right? Um, so make sure that you meet that requirement. If it's a, a summer intern job uh, for a, a, as a college student, if you've graduated a year ago, like don't spend your time applying for that. So make sure you match those. Um, Great. Also, make sure that you really read the job description and it matches what you're looking for so often. And I don't think candidates know this, but most companies have an internal recruiting tool and they can see how many jobs you've applied for at that company. So if you've applied for 57 positions from back end to media marketing, to front end, to data scientists, we can see that. And we can see that you haven't really read through each description to see what matches your skills. So, so I would limit it to two per company uh, application mm -hmm. wise. Um, and then lastly, um, this is optional, but I do read all of them. If you write a little message or cover letter explaining what interests you about this role in particular, like giving me a little bit more context, if you don't have a ton of experience, like I read those things and they're really important, especially if you've uh, looked into what the job is encompassing. So that's how I would approach it uh, if I were looking for something new today. 
Mm, that's so good too. I think sometimes we don't think about, we just, I just want any job at this company. We, if we apply for five or six, unfortunately on the other side of the house, it can look like this person isn't very focused or do they yeah. understand themselves? Do they know what they really want to do, which can kind of make us maybe nervous, mm. uh, right? So about self-knowledge. More isn't always more. I think like this misconception of like, I'm going to apply for a thousand positions and see if I land one. You're going to probably have to apply for a lot to land uh, um, an offer. Like it, it is the reality of it. However, if you are very uh, like conscientious of what exactly you're applying for, I guarantee if you apply for less positions, but that really fit your skill set and you've like really tailored your your resume and your cover letter to fit those roles, you're you're going to at least land more interviews, I would guess. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a great perspective. More is not always more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but also that sometimes I also hear in there too that you might have to interview a lot and don't like let that get you discouraged. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's normal, that's okay, that's nothing is wrong with you. <laughs> mm -mm. No, I <laughs> you know how many interviews I've been through <laughs> like a ton um the thing is like it's not about you or your skill set it's about what the team needs at that moment in time maybe I'm really really proficient in CSS and in animations and UX design but they need someone who's very technically savvy with TypeScript or C++ and I just don't have the the exact match they're looking for that's not on me I know I'm still a great developer right that that's where we get into the growth mindset versus fixed mindset um you know, and in, in, in all honesty, you can't change what the, what's going to happen after you end that interview call, right? So just trying not to stress about it. It doesn't say anything about you as a person. Well, and I will have time for one question, and that goes perfectly into this question. Um, any advice for how to deal with interview anxiety, especially for people who are maybe are already prone to anxiety? Like, mm. how do you handle that? How do you stay calm? Dude, it's super hard. Like, I'm just going to not beat around the bush. It, it's hard and it's scary and it's a skill. That's the thing we forget interviewing is a skill. It's a skill that most people hope that they never have to get good at, right? Um, yep. Yep. However, uh, the way I kind of overcame it was just by preemptively studying these concepts I know I was going to need before I had to have an interview. Now, I realized that I was 21. I didn't have a kid. I, you know... I had nothing else better to do with my time than be looking at different interview questions on like hacker rank or Codely or whatever those sites are called. Um, if you can prepare ahead of time, well before you know that you're going to need to find something, do it. Just do a little bit every day. These little atomic habits, another great book, um, they build up over time. And at some point you're going to sit there and you're going to think, wow, I've come so far and I didn't even need to spend like four hours a day doing anything. Um, Hmm. but yeah in all honesty like the anxiety I think the not knowing is the hardest part that's what gives me anxiety it's like what if I don't know the answer to something what if they ask me something and I don't know that's what I would get anxiety about um there are, they are going to ask you questions that you don't know um but first of all admit when you don't know that's a huge green flag for me as a hiring manager is like if someone can be like you know what I'm not sure uh this is my educated guess but honestly I don't know I'll be like cool that's someone I'd like to work with. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. And then uh, the second thing is understand how to effectively problem solve, right? So what? So if you get asked a question, first of all, they're left intentionally vague for, for reasons where they want you to explore uh, how to problem solve. Um, so they're going to ask you a vague question. Make a list of the things that you know. Make a list of the things that you don't know, but you're going to need. And then make sure you're repeating this back to them, right? You're allowed to ask them questions. You should be asking them questions. Um, yeah. So the, and then just work your way through. OK, so I know this and you can even say, you know what, this is not a performance solution. I'm going to do this the brute force method and I will come back and refactor if I've got time. And that's OK. You're allowed to do that. <laughs> mm, I love that. It's like being human. And, and also, I think there's this idea sometimes, especially for software engineers, about getting this answer right and that it is really OK to say, I don't know. And or and or here's how, how I would maybe think mm. about that. And the other, again, the other side of it, it's not just about getting the answer right. It's about how are we interacting as human beings? Yeah, exactly. Mm. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us during the session. Our next guest joining us on March 1st is Raji Rajakabolan, um, author of Daring to be Different Stories and Tips for a Woman Leader in Tech. 
Emma will be joining us over on the lead dev stack uh, uh, where she'll be um, slack, not stack, <laughs> where she will be taking some questions. Head over to the bookmark channel where that will be taking place. Thanks again for joining us today.